Okay, welcome to the USS Silverside Submarine Museum. Thank you. Thank you. We have a few changes. We just kind of want to go over things. I know you've met me before. My name's Teresa. Peggy is no longer with us. She has accepted a job at the Wright Museum in New Hampshire, and we're very happy for her. But we thought, you know, when she started as the director, the lecture series went on. So when she leaves as the director, we got to still have events because well, we enjoy them, and we think you guys do too. So we are going to continue to have them. It's going to be a little bit different this year, though. When it first started out, it was part of a Muskegon Community College class, and we decided then to kind of mirror their schedule and kind of go along with their plan. But over the years, we've stayed on their schedule, but we can't always mirror what they're doing because their students start over every year, and you guys are looking for, pardon the pun, the deeper dive. So we decided we don't really have to be a series anymore. One lecture doesn't have to be anything to do with anything else as long as it fits with our mission. So this year, we contacted several of our speakers that have come here over the years that we know you guys like, and we asked them, well, what do you want to speak about? It doesn't have to be what anybody else is speaking about. You know, you always, they're very good about coming on to our topics. We thought this time we would let them choose their own. So this year, you're going to see maybe a little bit different. And we also thought, since we're not part of the college, if we happen to get somebody in December or January that comes in and has a great topic, why not? And Sometimes there might be a week where we can't find a speaker, and well, then you get the week off and you just have to go home and do chores that night or something. So, we do, of course, always want to thank our sponsors. Blue Lake Radio is one of our sponsors. Um, I'm sure you're all very familiar with their music, with their camp. Um, they do live stream on the, over the computer. As I know, my parents lived in Melbourne for many, many years, and they listened to nothing but Blue Lake on their computer. So, they would call me in the morning and tell me, hey, there's a beach hazard statement, don't go to the beach today. He's like, well, if I can't go to the beach, I guess I'll go to work. <laughs> so even at my age, my mom was checking up on me. We also want to thank the uh, Lorraine F. and Fred S. Birch Foundation. They are our primary sponsor for the lecture series. They're very interested in education. They have recently sponsored three recipients of a scholarship for their continued education, as well as trying to continue their support for this lecture series. Our speaker tonight is Kurt Troutman. He's a retired Muskegon Community College professor, and he's probably still not used to hearing retired because he just retired this year, and so since the school year's only been going on for a little while, he probably isn't used to the retired thing, but still, we're very excited to have him here. Not only was he a history professor, but he and there's another one of our guests, George Maniatis, were the co-founders, I think, of MCC Center for Experiential Learning, because they believe learning doesn't always happen out of a textbook. They've arranged trips to Vicksburg, to Gettysburg. They took people to the United Nations, all kind of places for students to learn, to Chicago, that what you learn isn't just a book that you blow the dust off of. It's real stuff. It's real people. It's the real stories that they want people to do. Now, Kurt's also educated not only at MCC, but he spent some time on the uh, USS George Washington, teaching history to some of our sailors there. And I think he got the learning experience that when you go in one of those planes, you should have thought twice about that. Mm -hmm. But you survived without having to do any cleanup, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. And he also spent some time teaching in the Peace Corps in Lesotho, a country in South Africa. So he's kind of been teaching a lot of different places. So maybe if these military history things don't work out, you could ask him how to build a chicken coop or dig a latrine. I understand that that was something he taught a lot of at that spot, but maybe that's not necessarily what we're here to learn tonight. A couple of our lectures coming up, again, we gave our professors or our speakers the opportunity to choose. We have a two-part series starting next week, Acts of Love in a Time of War by uh, Fred Johnson, who most of you are familiar with. And after that, we're going to have a two-part presentation from Ron Janowski on the seeds of destruction, the events that led to the American Civil War. Thank you for somebody bringing the flag down. I thought we'd do something a little bit different. As you came in, you saw that there was a football game playing, which we don't usually do, but I believe this topic may eventually lead to some type of football thing. So we thought maybe today, instead of saying the Pledge of Allegiance, we would listen to an awesome Sparty band playing the national anthem for us. We do have a flag. You can stand for that and just enjoy the football atmosphere. Thanks. 
Okay, before I turn the microphone over to our speaker, I want to share a story that happened to us yesterday or Friday when we returned from a vacation to the Grand Canyon in Las Vegas. As we were boarding the plane in Chicago to come here, they asked when we arrived to not get off the plane right away because there was a veteran being flown to his final resting place and they wanted to let the honor guard escort him from the plane before the rest of the passengers. And nobody complained, everybody sat still. They didn't really give us any information on it. Turns out after a little research that Kurt did, it was a World War II veteran who had been lost in 1945, and they had finally been able to find and identify the remains to bring him home for his final, for his final resting place, where he was greeted at the airport by his 94-year-old brother, as well as other relatives who hadn't been born when he was here. But it was just kind of made you feel good that he got to come home and rest in peace near his family. So. Tonight's presentation is the Battle of Toledo, and I don't really know that much about it, so I'm going to turn it over to the expert who does. I will hand him the microphone, the clicker, and switch to his PowerPoint, and we'll be good. And I do need to thank not only Nicole, who you may have met in the gift store, who's a new employee here, but I also roped my daughter into doing a little change on the uh, on this show there we just did for a minute. So, you know, whenever technology outsmarts you, find the young people in the room, right? <laughs> so. Here's Kurt Trautman. Oh, good to see so many new friends and old friends here. I've been part of this museum for the better part of a decade and really just appreciate coming back here each and every time. I've had an extraordinary year. I retired, as Teresa mentioned, and even more daunting, I got married. Wow. Yes. So uh, anyone needing marriage advice, we just celebrated. I've got about uh, 55, 60 weeks under my belt. So uh, if you need any of that, let me know. I'm also new at retiring. Put your hand up if you're retired. Oh, I'm with good company here, I'll tell you. And that's where she was a little bit wrong. I know exactly what retirement's about. I love it every day. It's the best part of my life. I can't even remember working anymore. But looking around, I do see my fine stepdaughter, Rachel, back there, and I take a little consolation or uh, joy in knowing that she has more years to work than she's even been alive. <laughs> Great. So, thank you, Silver Size Museum. And when I say thank you to the Silver Sides Museum, I really mean to all of you. Because the institution is one thing, but the museum, any organization, is a collection of individuals. So thank all of you for being part of this museum. And if you're here for the first time, oh, welcome here. And be sure to look around and see if this is a place you want to be part of. If you've been here many, many times, we welcome you back each and every time. So welcome to the Silver Sides Museum, and just thanks to all of you guys. Oh, come on, technology. By cursing, it might work. It's still oh. Ah! There we go. Tonight's topic is the Toledo War. One of the incredible, extraordinary battles uh, in our history of this country is the Toledo War. And many of you may not be aware of what took place in Toledo, but in about the next 45 minutes, I can pretty much guarantee you, with or without technology, we're gonna walk out of here as experts in the Toledo War. So, Anybody here from the great state of Ohio? Good, we never liked them anyway. <laughs> what is history? We've been studying this our whole lives. We force it down young children. Uh, as older people, we tend to gravitate to it. What exactly is history? Well, I think it's a combination of his story and a combination of her story. So ultimately, when I think of history, I think of our collective stories. History is the story of us. 
We are all part of history. We all make history every day. We all sample it large, medium, and small. So today, we've got a nice history story on the Toledo War. There are always four elements to any good story. So the first element are characters. We have two main characters. The Michigan Territory, and that's important, and the state of Ohio. Those are our two main characters in the story. The setting. We're going to start in 1775 and walk our way up to present day. The conflict, the Toledo Border War. And ultimately the resolution. We're going to learn about resolutions through war, compromise, and football. So this is what we're looking for tonight. These are the four elements we're going to focus on in this great story. Still not working too well here. There we go. 1775, our country, our colonies, actually had a line of westward expansion, and that was called a proclamation line. While we were colonies under Britain, Britain drew up this royal proclamation and effectively demarcated about 125 to 140 miles inland along the ridge of the Appalachian Mountains, the line of westward expansion. Anything past that was not the American colonies. We see French Quebec in the north and kind of a buffer territory, we could call that, of the Indian Reserve, as well as the Floridas in the, in the south and to the west, the Mississippi or Louisiana era. But that demarcation line was one of the primary reasons we declared independence. So a nice painting here by John Trumbull. It's at the, uh, in Washington, D.C., and it's just a fabulous image of our Declaration of Independence. Ultimately, that declaration was an act of war, and there would be war. And this painting by Jonathan Copley really explains how or shares how this war was fought in the cities. It was fought in the cities with the current weapons of mass destruction, and that was fire. Fire was a weapon of mass destruction. Now, Washington crossing the Delaware is relatively famous. This is not really important to our story. But if we can't have a little irrelevant humor here, I'm not sure why George Washington is standing in a rowboat going across the Skoka River. I'm really not <laughs> sure. But um, perhaps it was safe for him safer than the boats behind him who are carrying horses and animals. <laughs> but this painting is nice because you look at the darkness on our right and George Washington leading us into the light. Really, is the father of our nation. The surrender in Yorktown. When General Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown, this really gave us the promise of our new nation. A Declaration of Independence, quite frankly, didn't mean anything. A declaration is only a statement of what you're going to do. We don't celebrate statements, we celebrate achievements or accomplishments. So this really was until this surrender at Yorktown that would lead to the formation of our nation at the Treaty of Paris. So the 1776 Declaration of Independence, we celebrate that, and it's nice, but really it's the Treaty of Paris. This is what gave tangible results to our quest for independence. The primary thing of this Treaty of Paris was look at how the map changed. We see that original proclamation line and now U.S. territory has virtually doubled all the way to the Mississippi River. So our quest for independence, won through Revolutionary War, negotiated at the peace conference, and now the 13 colonies have doubled in size. 
and we've got new territory. And new territory is going to result in these colonies, of course, which have now become states, admitting new states. <clears throat> The Northwest Ordinance in the Northwest Territory, this region that we know today as Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, this was the Northwest Territory. And thus it had a governing document to really articulate how this will be settled. <coughs> and that's the Northwest Ordinance. A little bit lost in our history of documents. We are very uh, revered with the Declaration of Independence, with our Constitution, but in a sense, almost equal of those is this Northwest Ordinance. And this would determine how these new states would be allocated, how they would be boundary, and what type of, uh, of human rights they would have in these states. So the Ordinance of 1787, what did it say? That the northern boundary of Ohio would be an east-west line drawn at the very southern tip of Lake Michigan. And we'll see that on a map in a moment. And this would establish precedent. These were the guiding documents. Again, Constitution, Northwest Ordinance, almost similar in its legislative strength. So this would establish the precedent for boundaries. <clears throat> Unfortunately at the time, we were using something called the Mitchell map. And this map, as you can see here, indicated that the southern tip of Lake Michigan was com almost completely to the north of Lake Erie. So using that map, that was the articulation that was drawn for the state of Ohio. So again, going back here, sharing that it's the southern end of Lake Michigan. This is, was the guiding document. And had this been correct, we could go home. There'd be no reason to be here. But it's not correct. So, when this state, Ohio was granted statehood in 1803. At this time, their governor used the Mitchell map to determine the northern boundary of Ohio. Made, that was logical. That was the map in use. However, when Michigan Territory was surveyed in 1805, was created, that's when they realized that the, this map was not correct. So it was at that time they realized this was not a correct map to use. What's important here is we are going to have a conflict between the state of Ohio and the territory of Michigan. So the Northwest Ordinance would be the guiding document. And this would indicate. And so we see really the correct line at the bottom of Lake Michigan and then the dotted line, which was done through the Mitchell map. This is the Toledo Strip. This is what's in discrepancy. <clears throat> Here's another map kind of showing you the same thing. So we see Ohio's border claim. We see the Northwest Ordinance claim. Michigan's not there because Michigan's not, not, a territory does not have a statement yet, but they will. So, Edward Tiffin was the governor of Ohio. He was also skilled as a surveyor. And he was surveyor general of this Northwest Territory. So he was not only skilled, he had a vested in interest. He commissioned a survey, and William Harris would take care of this, and they would conclude that the northern border, the Ohio border, was correct. That would be their conclusion. Lewis Cass was the territorial governor 
This was no man to trifle with. He would order a second survey. And led by John Fulton, that would indicate that the southern border was correct. So we have the northern border, which was determined by the governor of Ohio, and the northwest ordinance or the southern border uh, by the Michigan survey. And thus we have a conflict. Michigan would publish maps. Again, the Michigan Territory. So there were two boundary lines. And for the most part, it wasn't all that concerning other than a handful of people in Michigan and Ohio. So they were recognized a few miles apart, 468 square miles. And while Ohio claimed this territory, Michigan just sort of assumed jurisdiction. Not a problem until it becomes one. Here's a sign that shows that at the bottom Toledo, Michigan. So Michigan basically uh, invoked what we might call squatters' rights. They took over control of this Toledo strip. So this is what the conflict is about. Roughly eight miles wide. Who owns this land? And more importantly, who owns the Mommy Bay or the Port of Toledo? So why are these two entities fighting over this when land is of complete abundance? A few hundred square miles is nothing to be concerned about at this time in 1815, 1820, etc. This is really why. This area was a huge swamp, the Black Swamp. About 40 miles wide, about 120 miles long. This was what was most important to the state of Ohio. The land was not very usable at all. But they could not allow this impassable border to cut them off from the West. That was the concern. So the biggest concern here is a bit of Lake Erie, but Ohio did not want this natural border cutting them off from the Western part of our country. So this was not an issue until... Michigan sought statehood. As long as they were a territory, there, there was enough land for everybody. Now that Michigan is seeking statehood, there's going to have to be some type of arbitration. So Congress, in 1834, Congress would order a survey. They, Congress realized that the Ohio survey was in favor of Ohio. And the Michigan survey was in favor of Michigan. Congress found a non-interested party, a very skilled young West Point grant graduate named Robert E. Lee. And of course, 30 years from now, he would go on to be the premier general in the Civil War. And they would conduct a survey and agree with Michigan's southern border. And this led the Michigan governor, Stephen Mason, 22 years old. He's already the territorial governor. This is a man who's going somewhere. And he'd be inspired by this survey. He has the more evidence than he possibly needs. And he would lead armed volunteers down to Toledo to defend their territory. The boy governor, as he was called. So ultimately, for the next 13 months, the two states would engage in the Toledo War. Now, it was virtually bloodless. 
over this 80 mile strip, six miles wide, who is going to have control of this? The state of Ohio, the territory of Michigan. So troops are marching to the front. Governor Lucas is not going to be outdone by that boy. And that's how he was referred to, the boy. And he would take 600 armed men and arrive in Perrysburg, about 10 miles south of Toledo. And the Michigan governor is marching with 1,000 armed men. It's going to prevent any occupation of this area. And again, Michigan is somewhat occupied. It. They, if you had to look at who had squatters rights, probably Michigan, but not significant. There would be an altercation. Sheriff Wood would get stabbed. Yeah, more of a paper cut, really. That'd be the only bloodshed of the war. Now this is on the radar of President Jackson. He's going to have to act. He cannot let two states go to battle with 1,600 soldiers. So President Jackson, he's seeking a solution. His term is up. He wants to pave this way for his predecessor, Martin Van Buren. And Michigan is not going to stop him. So he does a very wise thing and consults his attorney general to get an opinion. Our attorney general is the top law enforcement officer in the country, and their opinions hold significant weight and value. So he would consult his attorney general. And what we'd find with Benjamin Butler is that he would agree with Michigan's claim that the tracking dispute must be considered as forming legally a part of the Michigan territory. That is not what Andrew Jackson wanted. Frankly, he couldn't really care less, but he does know that the state of Ohio votes in 1836 and the territory of Michigan does not. So this was something he should have, he should have considered uh, Attorney General Butler's opinion before he asked him. So, so far, this is the evidence that you have. The evidence in favor of Michigan, very strong, the Northwest Ordinance, that is the guiding document. The Fulton Survey, done by Lewis, commissioned by Lewis Cass, Michigan's territorial governor. The Congressional Survey, led by the young Robert E. Lee, and the U.S. Attorney General's opinion. The only thing on Ohio's side was the Harris Survey, which was commissioned by their own governor. However, the state of Ohio versus the territory of Michigan. So, game on. It is time for battle. And thus, an altercation would take place at Phillips Corners in the Toledo area as the governor wanted to remark the Harris survey, the quote, the Northern survey. He wanted that remarked. And Michigan was not going to allow that. So they sent in troops. The, the uh, survey commissioners escaped. Shots were fired. No one was killed, but nine members of Ohio were arrested. So again, uh, Nothing matters till it's personal. It's personal for both sides. And today this remains marked by the Battle of Phillips Corner. We probably have spent more time on it than uh, they might have at the time because it was not much of a battle. But nine people were arrested. And it was both sides trying to exercise their will who can control this land? Andrew Jackson is not a man to be taken lightly. He had recorded seven duels and probably many more. As a president, one time a gentleman came to the door, he opened it and the gentleman shot Andrew Jackson. 
he got up and beat that guy with a cane. He was not going to risk the votes of Ohio to satisfy the territory of Michigan. And thus he's looking for a compromise. How can he appease Ohio? How can this situation be averted? And it is somewhat of a Gordian's knot, a dilemma. What could possibly appease both sides? They are so entrenched, so dug in, no one is willing to take a step back and listen to reason. Sort of like politics today, I think. <laughs> so, we have to celebrate the state of Connecticut. Don't give me that look like what's <laughs> Connecticut about. Yeah. The state of Connecticut originally had their territorial claim on Long Island. They surrendered that in exchange for land in Pennsylvania. That land was desired by Pennsylvania. Connecticut surrendered it for this Cleveland area. 1773 surrendered it for the Toledo Strip. So Connecticut had keep surrendering their land right up to the Upper Peninsula. So Connecticut is a, is a part of this. So Jackson is going to talk to Connecticut. And effectively, when he says talk, it's going to be that proverbial gun in the side of the head, I'm talking, you're listening. And Connecticut would surrender the Upper Peninsula. They would surrender the Upper Peninsula and in exchange to Michigan, in exchange, Ohio would get the Toledo Strip. This was Jackson's solution. All parties, take it or leave it. And don't you dare push me. So, Michigan would meet in Ann Arbor at something called the Frostbite Convention. So it was a bitterly cold day. And they would have Michigan delegates debate this, and they would accept the Upper Peninsula, which is a whole lot of wasted land at that time with no access, no way to get there. In exchange for what they coveted the most, and that of course was not the Toledo Strip, statehood. So, December 14th, the delegates would accept it at the Frostbite Convention. A few short weeks later, Michigan is admitted to the state, to the Union as our 26th state, and thus the situation is diffused. Former President John Quincy Adams, never in the course of my life have I known a controversy of which all the right so clearly on one side and all the power so overwhelmingly on the other. It was learned opinion, of course, that Michigan lost, and they lost big. Upper Peninsula, they know what that, no one even knew what that was, yesterday or even today, perhaps. <laughs> so, before we go any further, let's do a quick review. Ohio got the strip, and we got the Upper Peninsula. Are we on the good end or the bad end? Yeah, I think we're on the good end. I really do. Ultimately, a couple of backstories there. Um, Michigan becomes a state on January 26, 1837. That's important to know because the election that Jackson was concerned with was conducted in November of 1836. And the territory of Michigan did vote. And they did cast three electoral votes. 
and those votes were suspended. And those votes were ultimately uh, going to be for Martin Van Buren, who was the candidate that Jackson was supporting. But Michigan, the territory, would cast votes. And they knew that was their leverage. So they would cast votes before they were a state. And those votes would be suspended. So again, our story, Ohio got the strip, Michigan got the Upper Peninsula, I think we're all pretty content. So, conflict is resolved? No. No. Yeah, because that would be too easy. Of course it's not resolved. Only one guy got injured a little bit. Not enough. Not enough. There you go. So the answer is no. The conflict is not resolved. So I guess we'd better keep going. In 1915, this is now 80 years later, a special survey put forth by Michigan would attempt to reincorporate the Toledo Strip into Michigan. They still wanted that strip. Those Toledo Munheads had to come our way. It was unsuccessful, but a small track of land was affirmed as Michigan, and I'll show you that in a map in just a moment. So Michigan put forth a special survey to reincorporate this land, and they would not be successful, but they would get something called the Lost Peninsula. And this map shows you Maumee Bay in Toledo, and that area in red had previously been with the state of Ohio, that entire small peninsula. So now, and today, that's 250 acres. And that land is Michigan land. And that is, there's, we have young people that live there, families that live there, the students have to take boats and ferries across to go to school. <laughs> All right, our two governors, they're putting an end to this. 1915, they would meet. We've got Governor Woodbridge on the right and Governor Ferris on the left from Michigan. They're going to shake hands. This is over. The War of the States has finally ended. And you see right now at the bottom of the screen is a large uh, granite marker that they would place. And it's um, about uh, 2,000 pounds. It's about seven feet high. It's dug in there. And that's at the border. This is done. The War of the States now is over. So the 1915 Ohio-Michigan State Survey Line would remain the same with the exception of that small um, Lost Peninsula. Fifty years later, our governors would meet to reaffirm this. And at the bottom, it's really it's kind of cut off here, but it says right at the bottom a phrase that we all know, good fences make good neighbors. So in 1915, so we talked about, was this done? Ultimately, it was not done or complete on statehood. It took 80 plus years to have another survey. 250 acres were reincorporated into Michigan as the Lost Peninsula. The governors met, shook hands, everything is over. And they buried the markers forever. And they would reaffirm it in 1965. So now I can ask you, is the conflict over? No. Okay, then let's keep going. Gee, these people really want these states. If Homer Simpson says it's not over, then it's not over. United States Supreme Court. Michigan v. Ohio. 
was argued in 1972 and decided a few months later. Michigan filed a Supreme Court brief seeking a new survey of the northern border. They contended that that northern survey that they had wanted for all these years, even that was not correct, that there is a new survey. So they want even more territory. Supreme Court disposed this to a special master. And among the first questions before the court gave this case away was to ask, why are we relitigating re this? What's going on? Please enlighten me. Your Honor, it's because there is oil and gas believed to be under the water. And there have been other mineral developments. So never underestimate the ability of any state to seek to maximize their revenues. Supreme Court would hand this off to a special master, Albert Morris, and he would hear the case and make some very definitive modifications that any boundary changes are done, period. He reject Michigan's claim. There's not going to be a, re a, a redrawing and Michigan shall bear all the costs of the lawsuit. So what started in 1755 as a Mitchell map, incorrect, which grew to a state and a territory conflicting over it, which then moved to a vicious war of one entire casualty. Well, not even that, so like I said, a paper cut casualty. A resurvey in 1915 and then a Supreme Court case in 1972. The matter is done, it's forever resolved, and for those of us who still want more territory in Toledo, we cannot get it. This case is sealed. So we started earlier today talking about the elements of a story. And the best element of the story, of course, is the resolution. And we talked about the resolution having three parts. War, which we talked about, compromise, which we've seen. Anybody remember the third aspect of this, the third element of that resolution? Football. football. So I gotta ask you, are you ready for some football? I think that's what we came here for, really. Any questions on the, the board? Yes? Just a couple of comments. I've done some reading on this. And, um, one thing was that I did read that a mule was killed. Yes, he, act about, he talked about uh, additional casualties, and yes, there was allegedly a mule that uh, became a casualty here. And one of the militiamen from Ohio had two sons who fought alongside him, and he named them one and two. And again, I've read that too. Uh, verified or not, it's probably good enough. You know what I mean? A good, good story, you know, we can't let uh, evidence hold us up. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What did Connecticut get out of any of this? They got nothing. Yeah. Connecticut had no way of governing that territory. They simply had held on to that. When we became a nation in, uh, in 1783 after that uh, Treaty of Paris, numerous states made out what we would consider today outlandish claims. Muskegon, we were part of Massachusetts. Many states made claims all the way to the Mississippi. So Connecticut was just following. They did not want to get boxed in as a small state. So what did Connecticut get from this? Uh, kind of what they deserved, nothing. All right, it's time for football. The Michigan-Ohio State rivalry would begin in 1897. This is almost 60 years, 58 years, and the opening football game, there were veterans of that war on each sideline. So nobody forgot anything. Nobody forgot anything. What is a Buckeye? Well, a Buckeye, the term, uh, Marriott, uh, Ohio is over on the, would be the southeast side of, of the state of Ohio, along the Ohio River. And Colonel Sprout was there and meeting with the Native Americans, 
Again, they dubbed him Hittuk, the eye of the big buck. So he had great big large eyes, very large eyes. That's where that comes from. And they've just adopted that as a buckeye ever since. Hmm. Wolverines. We got that name from Ohio. That was a name they bestowed upon us during that battle, that we were pesky little critters. There really weren't any Wolverines in Michigan to speak of, but, uh, and of course we took it as a powerful name. We liked it. Now today, Michigan is one of the few uh, schools that does not have a live mascot, but we used to. In 1920s, we had Biff, the Michigan Wolverine, and Benny. But they came a little too ferocious, and thus their career as mascots did not last very long. This is a piece of uh, advertising in 1925. And now here, of course, that picture, that Wolverine is not quite that big. That's a huge, uh, it looks like a small bear, actually. But when you're advertising, anything goes. Respect. Yes. Now, Biff and Benny were taken to the games and they were part of the war. They were the mascots. They chewed through those bars. Can you just imagine these Wolverines loose in a stadium? It's like, oh, you go catch them. No, no, I'm not going. You go. So that really ended their career. But for a short time, University of Michigan did have live mascots. I uh, did, was a graduate school at the University of Colorado in uh, Denver and Boulder, and we had Ralphie the Buffalo. And nothing was better than seeing a that small buffalo, frankly, not a full-size buffalo. It had six to eight handlers that you could say handle or the buffalo handled them, because they would run that buffalo around the side, and those poor guys would just be going for a ride. They had no control over them. In 1949, Michigan introduced what was called the murder wolf. And that hung around for a relatively short time, but uh, never really stuck. Whiskey and Brandy were two mascots in the late 1960s. Yeah, Wooly the Wolverine. Now, it didn't last but one year, but uh, the students that uh, created that, well, very successful company called Groupon. So they're not, they were not destined for, Wol for Willie the Wolverine, but they did have good business sense. And then in the late 1990s, we kind of, I guess we'll call it Murder Wolf 2.0. So Michigan's flirted with uh, uh, these um, mascots over the years. But we want to talk about the game. Because every year in our culture, it is just uh, one of the highlights of the fall. 1969, you had Ohio State under the legendary Woody Hayes. 22 game winning streak. Michigan, a new coach, Bo Schembechler, previously served under Woody Hayes. Coming to Ann Arbor for 103,000 people. And this would ultimately spawn what we call the 10-year war. I was used to small sport, but I remember this well with my grandfather and my father and my brothers. And the only way to describe this game is the scoreboard tells all. But this, uh, Michigan's had a long history, but this 10 years, primarily because of, A, they were both at national level teams, and B, Bo Schembechler serving under Woody Hayes for so long. So we have to ask ourselves, as Michigan people, do these teams like each other? I think Woody Hayes speaks for many people in Ohio. <laughs> I 
However, let's hope that we're not dessert this year at their Thanksgiving dinner. As that first year in Beauchamp, Beckler defeated Woody Hayes, uh, again, actions perhaps speak louder than words. Around the country, this is a rivalry that people are enamored with. Having lived in so many areas of the United States, it's just people asking me about this in Florida, Colorado, and elsewhere. So I suspect both teams uh, give as good as they get. But it is truly the best rivalry ever. It truly is. And um, each year, Many of the sports, ESPN and others, try to kind of rate the rivalries, and this consistently comes out as the number one. So when you enroll at Michigan, whether you play or not, these are the words to live by. And just a gentle reminder of last year, who was watching that or kept track of that last year at all? Yeah, that was uh, one of the highlights, so um, we will expect similar this year. And speaking of last year, ooh, ooh, go green. Go green. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we kind of got uh, pasted by the, the Sparties, so touche to them. Hail to the victors champions of the West. That West, we don't think of Michigan as the West today. That West comes right from the Northwest Ordinance. This was the Western part of the United States. That's where that comes from in that fight song. So if we have any Ohio State fans in the audience tonight, um, well, you know how we feel. So thank you for listening. I got a couple parting words, and any questions would be certainly be welcome. Probably that says it the best. <laughs> so again, the border war, a strange story over a strip of land that ultimately we lost and ended up with this extraordinary upper peninsula. So I think it's really fair to say we lost in the short run and we won overwhelmingly in the long run. Thoughts or comments or observations or? Yes, please. Yeah, a few weeks ago, I met a couple who were from Cleveland. They were here in town for a wedding, and they were actually nice people, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to meet some nice Ohio people. Uh, we, I think we've all met some, certainly. Uh, any of you guys familiar here with uh, Mr. Jack Fisher, an employee here at the uh, museum? Well, if you see Jack here anytime, any place, um, tell him you really like this presentation. He's got Ohio State in his blood. Yeah. <laughs> Other thoughts or comments or observations? Yes. I thought I remember one place that one of the issues on the Toledo Strip of the Maumee Bay was there were plans to build a canal that never developed. And, and that's that what, one of the reasons Ohio wanted it was because of this potential canal. Correct, and that, that's, that's a good observation. Yes, at this time, in the 1820s and 30s, our country transported itself by canals. The Erie Canal opened up the entire Midwest, and so the Erie Canal is essential. There was going to be another canal out of Maumee Bay, and that those really got put on the shelf, because that canal was designed to go all the way to Chicago and connect Chicago. Ultimately, the Illinois Canal was built, and that connected the Mississippi River to the city of Chicago. And had, so one of, two canals were not necessary. Without that Illinois Canal connecting Chicago to the Mississippi River, it would not at all be the city that we think of today. 
So yes, you're exactly correct. And that's, every story has got many layers underneath it. You're exactly correct there. The canals were essential. It just became redundant when the other canal got built. Well, I, I think also the, you're really in the beginnings of transcontinental railroads then, at that point, which suddenly becomes, do we really need to dig a canal when we can run trains? Correct, yeah, the canals would be, were going to be really the future of the country until railroads replaced the canals quite quickly. Quite quickly, you're exactly correct there as well. So, yes, we started as canals moving goods and services. Because when the Erie Canal opened up, and that you could take products from New York City all the way to Chicago, cutting the cost by 95%. Uh, the other route was around the water, up the Mississippi, and then portage to Chicago. But more importantly, the grains and stuff from the Midwest. Correct. And, and the food products going east. Very much. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yes, that our, our country, the transportation switched real quickly from the canals to railroads. Okay, well then that's all I have tonight. A, I'm very grateful for you guys to be here. Uh, one more comment, sir? Yeah, one more question on that. Sure. So, so I, you know, of course I heard about this war before and had much of this information. I got, you know, pieces. There are some new things here. But um, the one question that I had is that I heard it, you know, and then somebody said, oh, the, the, the rivalry between the two teams is, is like a continuation of that. It has its roots in that. And now the, the, the first game played where you had actually had uh, participants who were present at the game uh, made this connection. Participants in the, in the war at the g first game do people, do, is there anywhere along the way where people ever, you know, really said, yeah, this is like a continuation, or is that just kind of like a... Yeah, I think that might be a little more it? urban myth on whether the uh, this football game has been a continuation. However, keep in mind, at the turn of the 20th century, as we are going through this Industrial Revolution, there's a lot of competition for where the next big place will be. Cleveland, mind you, was home of Rockefeller and Standard Oil. So the idea that Ford and the entire automobile industry went to Detroit, they felt they lost that in some competition. So was this a, uh, an extension of the border war competition? Probably not. But the two states have been economically competitive for much of the 20th century. I grew up in a small town outside of Philadelphia, about an hour outside of there, and we had a gentleman who lived across the street from me who had this Michigan flag that he would fly out there. And in the Philadelphia area, there weren't really any football rivalries to know of, and we just could not understand. We thought something was seriously wrong with this guy. If they lost to Ohio State, the Michigan flag he flew was replaced by this black, gloomy black banner. It's like, what is wrong with this person? And then years later, we moved to Michigan and realized there's two whole states full of people just like him. <laughs> all, I can, all I can still say is, go green. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. Oh, one more question. In the rivalry, who's won the most? I haven't followed football all that much, but who's won more, Ohio or Michigan? Well, that's pretty interesting. I was just checking that out, and up through 2018, Ohio had a two-game lead. And in the last three years, I know we canceled one game, so I, it's close. Who has won the most games? Pretty darn close. I think Ohio's got a lead because the last 20 years, they've unfortunately uh, have had their way with Michigan for quite some time. But close enough for government work, as we say. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming tonight. As I mentioned, we have a two-part series starting next week with Fred Johnson called Acts of Love in a Time of War, so we hope you can return for that one. If you're ever able not to come in person, we do put it out on Zoom, which is then converted into some type of technology thing I don't really understand, but appears on our YouTube channel, so you can always watch it that way too. Of course, YouTube doesn't allow you to ask questions, and I'm sure if anybody has a question or anything or wants to sing the Spartan fight song with those of us who, you know, that's okay. <laughs> But thanks again for coming tonight. We're really glad to see you all here.